Wexler. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to the next session, which is session number 158. And this one is all about flexibility, spontaneity and intuition in the therapy process. Oh, what a wonderful... Oh, what a wonderful... I could talk forever about this, but what a wonderful title. What a lot of... It's a wonderful title. It is, it is. And I feel like it's it. I'm saying it must be because this is something that I don't often do in a therapy session. Is it must be really freeing? Mm, mm. I'm not saying I always have a plan in therapy, but I know I'm not that spontaneous. I'm getting better at listening to my own intuition and going off grid, maybe sometimes. Well, I tell you what kills spontaneity. And it sort of follows on from the last podcast in a way. Yeah. Self-criticism and self-attack and low self-esteem and self annihilation That that's annihilating yourself. That limits spontaneity altogether because yeah. we then need to be um getting things perfect or be in control or 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 we start to tell ourselves off and we don't allow, allow ourselves to have that level of flexibility or that level of spontaneity at all, because in TA terms, we have created a huge external parent in our head. Yes. It's come from a parental interject anyway, um, that is always there telling ourselves off. So we find it hard to be spontaneous or flexible. Yeah. The situation is diminished. Yes. Yeah. And I think when we we are, like you said earlier on, I'm not sure whether it was online or whether we were speaking offline about losing the creativity that is within us sometimes when we're more rigid. So people who have people who come to therapy and they um, have a lot of energy and rigidity. Or they overthink and stay in their heads or they have a high emphasis on control. They, they're, they're people by definition in TA terms will, will have, um, they'll spend a lot of time in their parent ego state. Yeah. They'll have a, or stroke and they will have a high energized critical parent. Yeah. I can relate to that, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> Which means if they've always got an active, um critical parent in their heads it's very hard to be flexible or have a sense of spontaneity when you're always hearing or expecting to hear oh this is the wrong way to go or how silly of you or yeah stupid of you and who do you think you are and all this star trap that is going on consciously or even unconsciously limits the ability for therapists and counsellors to be intuitive yeah intuitivity is built from the child ego state not the parent or adult i love that it comes from the younger self yeah because when we are intuitive and we're using our intuition we're kind of bypassing the a lot of the you know the the, the theoretical stuff or whatever which but, is really freeing and just just being in that moment with the client and seeing what happens absolutely it's bypassing the critical parent yeah often for us to get there we have to desensitize the parent we have to find a way that we can be friends to ourselves and compassion to ourselves and give permission to ourselves to be spontaneous, to experiment with intuition, to have flexibility of thoughts and decisions. Yeah. The, the, these conversations that we have, Bob, always get me thinking 
I, you, you know, to me, and I'm so honoured to be doing these podcasts with you because there's not a single podcast that we don't do where I come away feeling a better therapist or that I've learned something myself from doing this. So I want to say a big thank you to you for that. Well, I feel uh, moved by your kind words. And what were you thinking about just then to say that? Because I could see your eyes. I mean, I'm doing this podcast with you, so I could see your eyes go up to thinking. So what were you actually thinking when I said about those few? Were you thinking of uh, my fantasy about what you were thinking is that somewhere there's a sort of critical power within you that might be um, dictating you to go certain ways. I, what were you thinking? Absolutely. And I think that the phrase that came to mind was that there is a place for intuition in therapy. Yes, a big central place. Yeah. And it so just suddenly dawned on me as we were having that conversation. I've always struggled personally and, it, you know, in turn professionally that there's a line between being spiritual and intuitive and creative and being professional and I don't know. Without intuition, spontaneity and flexibility may not grow. It's certainly. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. And you know what you said then about do you know what I mean? that it's it's in our our child ego state but you know the the intuitive part of us which mm -hmm. i know for me through going through years of personal therapy that i'm not always in touch with my child ego state i'm much more comfortable in my parent ego state usually the critical parent as well yeah i mean you can read many books on intuition i i, I know eric Byrne, the creative ta wrote about uh, intuition and i'm not sure he said this so i I'm not going to say he did. But one of the quotes I often hear in different articles, I'm not sure I did say, uh, and that is intuition is often destroyed through the journey of socialisation. Yeah, yeah. The parents growing up socialise and conventions and everything that goes with it. Yeah. Often destroys the fertile ground for intuition. Yeah. So, intuition is in the world of the younger self. Absolutely. That's why one of my favorite sayings, or inquiries, or permissions, is when people get caught up in their heads and their cognition, which is very common. Yeah. Um, I'll ask them to guess about, you know, I'll say, okay, I understand you may not. Da, da, da. What about if you just guessed what your response would be? to xxx that bypasses all their cognitive aspects that they have to be perfect or whatever and it gives them permission to head towards an intuitive response yeah see even you just saying that my the inner part of me was freaking out guess what do you mean guess i need proof i need i need this i need that i can't just guess well i'll tell you if you do need proof and all the things you've just said then the problem with that is that proof will only head one way. Yeah. Yeah. And the proof has to go through my own personal filter. I'm oh. looking at it with, with all my baggage and all my stuff. So the proof that I think is proof is probably not proof anyway. <laughs> Your committees. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's, again, it's an amazing thing, Bob. I'm going to use guesswork in my yeah, therapy do, room do. a lot more. Yeah. It's only give permission. Yeah. Um, to... But I've got a grandson who's, he turns six next month and he's at that phase now where he's starting to be quite critical of himself. You know, up until sort of, you know, four or five-ish, they don't question what they do. They're just free-spirited and, you know, there's no self-criticism, there's no judgment. And then they get to a point where suddenly... They start to compare themselves to other, and then they start to to judge, and they they do lose part of that, yeah, intuitive, creative, free child. So the therapist needs to give permissions to the client to visit that place again. Yeah, yeah, I believe, and also I believe in modelling. By yeah. the way, yeah. So if the therapist can model a sense a sense of spontaneity 
a sense of flexibility around options, a sense of real intuition, or at least playing with intuition, then you're giving the client permission through, or even through modeling to experiment with that. So the younger self comes out more. Yeah. Really think, interesting. Yeah. I think it's really important. Uh, and something I really believe in professionally, and I, I, of course, personally goes with it, but I mean, professionally, but when I start experimenting with the child ego state or permissions for the client to access their younger self, I always remember and I often say to myself, because I don't say to the clients um, necessarily, usually to myself, to look out for the parent ego state. Because with the younger self comes the parent. If we change language, Freud, we used to talk about the part of the self called the id, which is yeah. the younger self or unconscious. And he talked about <clears throat> the... Um, higher authority if you like um the ego um or super ego he used to talk about which we could see as a parent and he talked about the super super ego and the id um coming together so i always think in ta terms about the parent that will be like a shadow above the younger self that's really important because it makes me then realize the importance or to myself anyway of can give permissions to the client to express their younger self and at the same time um informing that shadow to go away yeah so yeah. i see the shadow and the youngest child together Yeah, because we, we can't just focus on the, the younger self because the parent will always be there. That's right. We can, in our heads, I say, I'll keep it inside my head. I just yeah. Because then I'm looking for what stops the person's younger self really being spontaneous, flexible, intuitive. And it's always going to be a shadow. There's a wonderful book called The Shadow Above the Object by and i've forgotten the name of this classical book oh gosh i've read it so many times but the book is called the shadow above the objects anyway so uh, is it cornell no it's not cornell anyway it's about the whole idea of with the younger self emerging which is the object will be will always be the shadow you know looking over whatever yeah. way yeah that is what stops usually the emergence of the intuition and flexibility and spontaneity we're talking about so you always as a therapist going to have to take on that parent or that shadow or whatever word we want to find because, you know, as you're talking about this and saying that the shadow and the child egos, that I find it easy to to visualise what you're talking about and then I can make sense of what it is. Do you okay. know what I mean? You're kind of painting a picture of of something that then makes perfect sense, yeah. I mean, Lord Steiner, who was the prodigal son many, many years ago um, of Eric Byrne um, in Transaction Analysis, wrote a book called Swift People Live, but, uh, but he often talked about the critical parent as the pig parent. Yeah. Mark called darker shadow and young in terms. He could about archetypes. But if we're going to think about it, I you might want to think of an ogre or whatever it is. I'm talking about the negative pig parent. I'm not talking about the positive parent here because yeah. it was the the you know more critical. Um, Parent or which is impairing flexibility of options and spontaneity and intuition. Yeah. And sometimes you need to talk to that part of the client and help the client um, or give permission to the client to express their younger self 
while you um, hold the parent at bay. Yeah, I'm thinking as you're talking about, do you know what I mean? Some of the clients that I've got that I I know I know this would really massively help them, but I also know that they would <laughs> they would find it hard to to be in their child ego state because of all the what ifs. I need to be responsible. I can't be intuitive. I can't be free spirited. I need to be in control and it it's fighting that defense mechanism a lot of the time. Is that you speaking? Well, you say you, being in control and all things. You've yes, just... but also you know I can think of clients that would think a similar thing that you yes. know having that that running yeah. dialogue yeah. protects me from making mistakes or protects me from replaying past behaviors or X Y and Z whatever it is. Yeah, maybe they need to. I know you don't work this way, but immediately I think. Or maybe they need to tell their parent that you're talking about that everything's okay. They don't have to be so cautious. I'm yeah. now 33 or whatever it is. I could experiment. But thank yeah. you very much for looking after me and being co cautious and protective all these years. But if you care for me, just once would you allow me to express See, I love that, Bob. Just off the cuff, you come up with these amazing things. I just love that. Because that's really compassionate, isn't it? You're not... You're not beating yourself up or you're not, you know, effing and jeffing at this parent that's trying to protect you. You're being really nice to it and saying, do you know what I mean? You yeah. you don't need to do it. And basically, whatever happens, I will be okay. I mm. might mess up, but I will be okay. Yeah, when I work with the parents, I'm always looking for the child in the parent, the vulnerable part of the parents, not going into some competitive battle. With the yeah. Parents. Yeah, so, so I'm much more likely to work that way because the parents or that part of the client we're talking about here um, usually has a parent within their own parent, which is um, stopping them being spontaneous and uh, following their intuition themselves. Yeah, which I know we have spoken about this in the past, that it's kind of generational and it goes up and up and up and up. Exactly, yeah. So, but I'm a great believer in modeling creativity. I'm a great believer in modeling the things we're talking about here. And I'm also a great believer in permissions. Yeah. The therapist actually explicitly giving permissions for the for you know the client. It's okay to just experiment. I'm here, nothing's gonna happen, the world's not gonna collapse, and um well, you can all stop if you want to anyway, but how about you just draw with your less less dominant hand what you're feeling at the moment, or whatever it is you want to yeah, help yeah, yeah. To express their feelings with. Um, and you're sort of given those permissions and at the same time <laughs> saying, well, it's okay, I'm here, and providing a protective process as well, a safe harbour in the therapy room to be uh, exploring their younger self. Yeah. Especially with people who overthink a lot. You need to find a way to get to what's beneath the protective function of the overthinking. Yeah. Permission yeah. Often yeah. By, permissions often bypass that process. But you have to explicitly say them. No point just waiting and thinking to yourself as a therapist or counseling in your head. You need to explicitly give those permissions to the client and actually you're giving to the client's younger self so it starts off with it's okay for you know to x or you know, i'll be here we can just experiment it's okay it's okay to be you for a moment yeah so it was, always starts off with it's okay it's okay for you to press phoenix i'm here and we'll always stop if we ever want to so the permission always starts with it's okay it's okay yeah, and the, well, the, the, it, it's not necessarily a battle. Do you know what I mean? Even yeah. just the way that you're saying it, it's okay. We can stop if you want to. It, you know, you you're not going that far down the road that there's no coming back or whatever it is. Yeah, we're providing a protective space. Yeah, safe harbor, a secure base, and I'm here. Yeah, and I'm here. 
And I can see that, you know, in, in a session like that with you, that, you know, you, you spoke about it. I'm not sure if it was in this one or the last one that, you know, the, the clients will feel a lot lighter. You being there somehow and taking the responsibility that it's OK, I can practice this just means that they don't need to worry about that. They can actually look at things without the worry. Mm. So yeah. that's, you're giving their permissions explicitly to them and they're giving permissions to themselves, the younger part of themselves. Yeah. So permissions and modeling, I think, is imperative to help a person express their younger self in a safe place. Yeah. Which then, once you know, we're able to do that, then the you know the flexibility, the spontaneity, and everything else just falls into place. That's the time that we can be flexible. Yeah. And you and and on that point again, we need to, yes, and they need to feel safe. Yeah, yeah. Not only with you, but the place where they're in. Yes, yes, yeah. Is there any when you've done this work with somebody in in the therapy room? Is there anything that you need to do before they leave the therapy room? Make sure that they are in their adult legal state, okay. and they are. Yeah, yeah. They're in the, they're, they're they're coming from the age that they actually they are. are. Yeah, yeah. My case would be seventy three, so I'd be checking with you. Know, are you in your adult legal state? Are you in the here and now? Are you old enough to go and drive your car? And you know, not quite who's the prime minister of the day, but yes, yeah, I get you. Yeah, yeah. Adult, and they're not in the child. So yeah. you've had that discussion. Because I can imagine when you've done some deep work like that, working on the younger self and, you know, lots of visualisation and, and, you know, modelling and creativity and all that sort of stuff, that, you you know, potentially they do need to be grounded before they go out. And much more than potentially. Yeah. They have to be. Yeah. You don't. <laughs> you make sure you you've got at least 10 minutes of time. Yeah how much time you want to give to make sure that in their adult ego state and you might want to do a debrief of the work which would make which would concrete you know through observation that they're in an adult ego state yeah so if i was to do that type of work i would certainly um if it was in an hour for example i would stop after 50 minutes yeah and be in my head to frame it that way if yeah. it was a 50 minute hour It'd be in my head to stop after 40 minutes. Absolutely. Yeah. To, to, when I say stop, I mean, you could then got 10 minutes to make sure they're coming from their adult ego state and they're not leaving the room at the age of seven or something. Yeah. And like you say, a debrief session on it and what they got from it. And you, I, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I always do that in terms yeah. of security. I don't want them to leave <laughs> you know, the room. The age of four or something and catch the bus or the tram or uh... which again it sounds you know for, for anybody that's not used to this sort of talk it's like but they are they're the same age as what they were when they walked in but psychologically when you've done this work they're not <laughs> no, they've gone black they psychologically have gone back to a different place so this is a sentence to bear in mind psychological time and real time are not the same thing yeah absolutely yeah so you're actually checking they're in a different psychological time zone from when they came in and to make sure they're in their adult place so they can act think and feel as a 73 year old or whatever they are yeah leave the room and a debrief is a very good way to do it yeah So yeah, it always needs to be there at the forefront of our mind before a client leaves. I I always make sure, do you know what I mean, that I've not seen one client straight after another so that I have got that time to, and for me as well, do you know what I mean, to get my head back in the space as well. <laughs> yeah. And I'm not carrying one client over into the next client. No. So in this video, I hope... Well, I'd like to hope that I and yourself have given permissions for 
people listening to this podcast to maybe reflect on experimenting with their own intuition and it doesn't mean leaving clinical thought behind but to give themselves a liberate liberation if you like to have a sense of spontaneity uh, in the person that that i believe will model down to clients on how to be different yeah i'm going to commit to doing more of that bob good i look forward to that with great um interest i will feed back to you so what we're going to look at in the next session is opening a pandora's box within the therapy process I wonder what that, I want to put that type down. I wonder what that's about. Oh, I think it's about, uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. I'll leave the anticipation and the excitement and the imagination uh, till the next. Um... For us all, me included, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> Until next time. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, goodbye. Take care. And you. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.